Thanks for having us. We're really excited to be here. Um, I'm with Colette Yee, the dog trainer and handler for the Conservation Canines Program, um, specifically for the Orca Scout Project. So this is a project that started uh, back in 2006, actually, um, doing fluke follows, which are um, a bit invasive. Uh, you have to get close to the whale in order to be kind of right behind their fluke print. Um, we did that for a couple of years to make sure that we had enough samples to train the dogs on. And now the vast majority of our samples after the dogs are trained are collected at somewhere between 400 meters and 1,000 meters away. So we, we never actually really, <laughs> oftentimes we don't see the whale. Um, so we'll just get to it. So uh, this is our... Um, so this is our general range. We um, do have research permits both in the U.S. and Canada, which makes it easy. We don't have to worry about stopping at this uh, international border, invisible border that um, uh, the whales don't see. difficulties okay so everybody knows the threats they were listed in uh, um, Canada in 2003 and in the US in 2005 uh, with these three main identified threats um, there are more um, increased shipping and the potential for oil spills uh, very high among them and then also we know unfortunately from some genetics data um, inbreeding is uh, um, an issue as well Gosh, guys, sorry. Just flip past the. Okay. Um, you can go past that one. So uh, it's important to um, kind of just some basic summary statistics that um, there are only 26 reproductive age females at this point, but even that low number, it's worse than that. Um, there are only 14 that have successfully had calves. And um, uh, just the um, transient killer whales or the mammal eating killer whales in this region, as Jeff Friedman pointed out yesterday, um, they're increasing their numbers so the females are having calves every three to five years successfully so the calves are living um, and mom is living. Um, that's absolutely not the case with these guys. So um, out of the 11 babies that were born during the so-called baby boom, kind of end of 2014 to beginning of 2016, only five of those animals are still living. Um, and then also recent um, information that came out of NOAA um, that the population genetics are quite low because most of the um, fathering was done just by basically two animals. And unfortunately, um, a large majority of the animals that we've lost recently are males that are just getting to be that age when they would become uh, uh, reproductive members of the population. So we're losing them right at that critical point. So as Giles just told you, the southern residents are facing various issues. Now in order to better understand this species and uh, evaluate those threats, it's going to take a little bit of research. Now studying wildlife can be difficult, especially when you're dealing with a rare or elusive species. So to address that issue, Dr. Samuel Wasser, the director of the Center for Conservation Biology at the University of Washington, created a way to study wildlife in this sort of new, efficient and effective manner. So in 1997, he modified techniques used to train narcotic detection dogs to instead locate scat, um, thus creating conservation canines. Uh, so why dogs? Why did he choose to use dogs for this method? Why not just walk around looking for the scat yourself? Um, well, you could, but it could be really hard. What, what do you do when the scat is small or hidden underneath some leaf litter or buried, or in, in this case, floating around in uh, moving waters? So using their keen sense of smell, oh, sorry. using their keen sense of smell, um, dogs are able to greatly increase our sample acquisition rates. They can detect odors in as little as three parts per million. Uh, so an example here, you see Tucker up there. Uh, he has been the 
orca scat detection dog for many years on this project and retired last year, but he was able to detect an odor from over a nautical mile away, even in really fast moving currents. Wow. Um, so that's pretty impressive for, for our dogs. So the Conservation Canines Program offers a unique form of wildlife research in that we utilize detection dog handler teams to work on studies that aid in wildlife protection. So having a skilled team that can communicate and trust one another allows us to solve some of the most pressing ecological problems around the globe. Now why SCAT? Why on earth, out of all the things you could study, why would you want to be the person who is studying poop? Uh, well, there's, there's actually many reasons for that. SCAT is the most readily available thing you can collect from an animal. Depending on the conditions of the water, a killer whale SCAT can float for about 30 minutes. It's non-invasive and can be acquired without disturbing the subjects. Non-invasive sampling is a lot less stressful to the animal compared to methods that may require capture or other physical contact. And it's an information goldmine. We can obtain a vast amount of information from one small sample. Um, and you can, get all, you can answer a lot of questions in just one collection. Uh, you, I mean, obviously a killer whale is going to have some pretty big poops, but we can work with as little as half a milliliter. So who are the cons who are the conservation canines? Um, where do we find these incredible wildlife warriors? There's certain things that we look for in a dog with, uh, when we're selecting a dog for our program. Uh, the first thing is that they are a rescue dog. They come to us from shelters, rescue organizations, and owners who are at their wits end trying to. Owners who are absolutely at their wits end trying to um, give them the mental and physical demands that they need for the, these high energy dogs. We take dogs who don't do well as house pets, ones that keep getting returned to the shelter, or spent a long time there. <coughs> Many of our dogs were labeled as destructive or aggressive when really they just needed an outlet for that excessive energy. And most importantly, our dogs have to have ball drive. Um, so what I mean by that is we look for the dog who will play fetch over everything else. Um, ones who just obsess over it. When you take the ball away, they spend their time looking for it or just waiting for another toss. You can bring out a ball and you see their eyes dilate and their body just start to shake with anticipation that they're going to get to do the best thing in the world, which is just play a game of fetch. Um, and so you may have noticed I just listed off a bunch of characteristics, not any specific breeds. Uh, so we can see here, these are all current CK9s within our program. None of them are the same breed, none of them are the same size. We have some 80 pound labs all the way down to some Jack Russell Terriers. What they all do have in common is that high energy and that high ball drive. These are all dogs that didn't fare well in homes. And a large part of our mission is to give dogs like them with nowhere else to go a chance to work and a chance to just have a, 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 a second shot at life. <laughs> so out of our 17 current working CK9s, we have two dogs trained to work on Killer Whale and that is CK9 Jack and Dio. And you'll be seeing Dio a lot this summer and hopefully Jack maybe a little bit later on in the year. Ingrid for that awesome picture of Dio, by the way, in his goggles. <laughs> All right, so how do you train a dog to find killer whale scat? So it is a bit of a process. Um, we start with something called box training. So the box allows us to just introduce a certain species scat to the dog. We do it kind of in a closed room with minimal distraction. And we have this box here lined up with a bunch of mason jars. Every single jar is empty except for the one target. We walk the dog down the line, have them sniff every single spot until they get to our target sample, and then immediately award them with the ball. After doing that for some repetitions, they start to anticipate that they're going to get the ball. They, they start to associate that idea that that scent means their reward. So once you see that they're anticipating it, and what I mean by that is they'll literally go up and sniff and immediately start looking for that ball, then you know you're ready to move on to the next phase. So that's where we take it into our sit exercises. So the dog needs to be able to indicate to us when they've found that target sample. 
So we take them outside, we're introducing the wind, maybe some other smells, just kind of upping the distraction a little bit. Uh, walk them around and help them sort of find the scent and get, have them indicate to us with a sit when they've gotten there. And again, keep rewarding with the ball. Now it's time to up the distraction a little bit more and we start doing some land exercises in, in the field. So we actually take killer whale scat and we hide it up on logs, on rocks, next to some water, under trees, places where you obviously wouldn't find killer whale scat. But that doesn't matter to them. They're just associating that odor with their reward. Now comes the fun part, taking it into practice on the water. So we just use your everyday sort of Tupperware, put a killer whale scat in it, float it out on the water and drive the boat away. Um, we work the dogs into that and teach them how to, to, to rely on that communication in order to get to those samples, because they're used to just being able to run up to it. So it's a pretty big adjustment, having them not have their legs to be able to run up to a sample. Sorry. Oh, that's okay, we can go there. Where are we? <laughs> oh, perfect, yeah. Um, so the information that we can get from a killer whale scat, uh, just like I said earlier, it's incredible how much you can find from a single sample. So we can confirm the species, we can identify individuals and confirm their sex. We can find out their reproductive status, if they're curling carrying, if they've recently had a calf. We can find their stress hormone levels, their nutritional status, and physiological and disease state. So one sort of one sample, like we said, can address all of the all three causes of the southern resident killer whale decline. So now time to actually put it into practice. Uh, we set up our transects based on the direction that the whales are traveling, which way the water could be pushing a sample, and the way that the wind could be carrying that odor to the dog. The boat needs to be downwind at a 90 degree angle. Uh, the detection dog does the fine tuning from there. So it starts with, with Giles making sure she's setting us up for success, and then the dog giving us that little fine tuning. So here's just a little animation to kind of give you an idea of how this works. Um, if we have... All right, so we have our whales traveling that direction and the wind coming off of them. The water pushing behind them and we have this nice lovely scat, what we're looking for. Here comes Moja, our boat. <laughs> and what this kind of shows is uh, the scent cone. So this is the way that the odor will be dispersing over the water. So our goal is to get into that red zone. That's where the scent is going to be really concentrated. So the dog will kind of indicate to us where they want us to turn in and we just sort of do fine adjustments until we get to where we need to be. To kind of get an idea of how, how it may look to the handler, if say this is a scat and those dotted lines are our scent cone again, the dog's gonna be alert and, and kind of just scanning around until uh, we get onto a sample. So once they hit that scent cone, the dog usually tends to pull over the side of the boat and uh, they're, they're <laughs> leaning into it because they're trying to get into that, that concentration of the odor. When we're right in the middle, that red zone that we kind of showed in the last slide, the dog will move over to the side and that's when we tell Giles to turn in and it's time to go after it. If we accidentally pass the, the scent cone, the dog will usually kind of turn around and face the back of the boat, and that's a good indicator that we need to actually flip around and try again. So here's just a, a slide showing where we've collected our, our samples in the past. Most of them are on the west side of the San Juans, uh, but they are pretty spread. We will go into the Canadian waters and spread all around this area. And sometimes we do find things other than fecal. Um, you can get some parasites, and we've actually collected a couple nice snotty mucusy somethings um, this year. So what the fecal um, is able to show us is um, really what's happening with the fish. Um, as the whales are uh, 
eating a lot of fatty fish. We just had an, a, an amazing example of this just this past week. And thankfully we had Linda Mapes and her crew on board um, to record this. Um, when the whales first came back in, they came in last Thursday and then we were able to get out on them on Friday. And we were able to collect these really, really amazing fatty rich samples that um, filled two two we got two samples and each uh, filled pretty nicely up the up the two up the 50 mil tube with feces um, again really fatty rich um, you could actually see the fat in the feces and that's what makes it float and then the longer the whales were in the inland waters and we actually even had some of the pod leave because there wasn't enough fish most likely um, the smaller group of jays uh, stayed and the more time they were in the less um, the less solid their feces have become um, since we've been been out there so we've collected 12 samples in the last five days and uh, you could just chart it if you, if you just looked at fat content i bet you could just time it for exactly um, compared to uh, what's happening with the Albion test fishery. So this is this graph here is showing overall back to 2008 um, with both the Columbia River runs on the left and the um, Fraser River runs on the right. And if just generally speaking over time those those runs have become smaller. <coughs> So overall findings are um, that, the, as I said, the best, uh, the whales come in in the, uh, in the spring in their best nutritional state, most likely because they are out on the outer coast, presumably eating uh, fish from the Columbia River Basin. We know from satellite tagged data that they do spend a lot of time uh, out there circling around the mouth of the Columbia. So we know that's an important area from them. Uh, for them. They also are often spotted at Swiftshire Bank, which is another kind of staging area for fish, uh, depending on what the tide is doing. Um, and the whales know that and they go there. So um, they come in in the best nutritional state and then we are able to measure their uh, cortisol levels and their um, thyroid levels showing um, just kind of how stress levels rise as nutrition levels decline. Uh, DDT is most prevalent, uh, probably you guys already know this, but DDT is most prevalent in L-Pod, the pod that tends to go down to California. In fact, we call it the California Signature uh, because DDT was so heavily used in California, not so much in Oregon and Washington and BC. Um, K-Pod is the second most, uh, the second highest for uh, DDT and J-Pod um, um, trailing. Uh, the toxins stay in the blubber as long as they're getting enough to eat. So this is like the one time that it's good to be fat and stay fat. Um, is uh, if you are getting enough all the time, then you're not circulating those toxins. So that's why we have these mammal-eating killer whales in this region that are doing really, really remarkably well. We saw some photos of them yesterday that were just stunning. They are humongous animals compared to our, um, as Dave Elifert from the center calls them, our puny southern residents and they are getting smaller over time. So as mom doesn't have good nutritional state herself, uh, her gestating fetus is going to be smaller. We see that in humans as well. Um, so this graph uh, shows um, pretty clearly that uh, when there's high levels of food, their toxin level is lower. Um, so it's a busy, it's a busy chart. Um, I don't want, I think we're maybe getting a little close to time, so I won't go into it too much. I'm really happy to talk about this one. I think this is, this is one of probably five that I would choose as, um, if I had only five to show to the governor or uh, president, if it was a different president, um, this would be one of them. Um, because it's very clear that, that food is very key for these guys. Um, this is also a neat graph, um, which basically showed, and this is uh, Dr. Sam Wasser's lab was able to show that we can tell uh, the same information from feces as you can from blubber. So in the past, they had to do uh, blubber biopsies to get information about toxins on the animals. And uh, this, this graph is showing that, no, actually we can do it from feces now. So again, non-invasively collected using the dogs allows us to, um, to get, the same, get at the same information as, as a, a blubber biopsy would. And uh, unfortunately, a paper that came out last year, right around this time, June of 2017, showed that 69% of all pregnancies are lost before the baby is born viable. Um, 
that's a huge, huge percentage. So that that's not even talking about the firstborn calves where we have a really high death rate of firstborn calves. This is a separate, uh, a separate and uh, very, very disturbing addition to that story. So the whales are getting pregnant regularly, like the like the mammal eaters are, but they just don't. They're not. They can't carry them. And the science did show that um, those females that were nutritionally stressed are the ones that are losing their calves. And really, unfortunately, a large portion of these are late-term pregnancies. So 23% of those 69% are late-term pregnancies. So this is when it's very, very um, dangerous for the female. We lost uh, one of our most uh, well-loved animals, J32. Um, her calf died, almost full-term calf, massive calf, also female calf, which is uh, even a, a double whammy. Um, her calf died in her and and started rotting, and which ultimately killed J32, which created a, a at least a buoyant situation within her body, which allowed her to float to the uh, float to shore. And at least we were able to get information from her um, her body and from her calf. But it's as you can imagine, much much harder and more dangerous to pass a full grown dead calf than it is to um, pass one in, in earlier time in pregnancy. So we have a lot more to say, but um, we're, we'll be here for a little bit more this morning, um, and then we're both here on the island uh, through October. The study goes through October. Um, if you want to get in touch with us um, on email, you're welcome to. Uh, wanted to give a shout out to um, our current interns, Eve and James, that are here. They've been putting in an amazing amount of time. <laughs> and we can work it out. We love to take people out with us. Um, the more people that know what we do and how we do it and why it's important for us to do it, um, you become the ambassadors for the science and for the whales. So um, do uh, get in touch with us if you've got some time to spend and uh, wait around for whales. Jeff, we, we, are, we are trying to wrap it up, but just quickly, I can see that London has her hand up over there. Do you have a quick question? Uh, yeah, so you talked about the cortisol levels in the scat, cortisol levels in the scat, so, and so I know that's a stress hormone, so have there been any studies done uh, if, if there are higher cortisol levels in the presence of both? Has there? Yeah, good question, London, thanks. Mm -hmm. So Catherine Ayers, who was Sam's first grad student to work on this project, that was the subject of her paper. It came out in 2012. So the question is, is um, do we see higher levels of stress hormones uh, in the whales in the presence of, uh, well, larger numbers of boats? Um, and the, the question is, uh, um, the answer to that is yes, if their nutrition level is low. So that study was very, very clear where if, again, if the whales are getting enough to eat, we don't see this massive signature of stress levels spiking in the, in the presence of, of vessels. So um, that, is a, that is a study that is going to be redone. Um, Catherine was working on about 69 samples. Um, we have over 600 samples now. And so that's one of the analyses that, um, that we are going to rerun this many years later. So um, hopefully soon we'll, we'll be able to look at that again. Okay. Any other questions? No? Okay, well, we'll be around for a bit. Yeah. yeah. And Giles, will you be, will you be at lunch tonight? Yes. Mm -hmm. Has anyone ever taken scat samples from the, the whales in captivity? They won't give us scat samples. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Well, early on, we had no idea what killer whale feces looked like, and so we contacted SeaWorld to ask if they would be willing to give us some samples. And they said no. Was that? When? Yeah. Um, that would have been back in, I'm going to guess, 2006 through 2008, something like that. By 2009, we were 90% dog, and we didn't, need, we didn't need captive samples. We were able to rely on the dogs almost completely by 2009. Great, thank you so much.